that. But um, so I'm glad he's doing better and they figured it out. And I thought maybe he swallowed a rock. That's what I thought. Maybe he swallowed a rock. Because, you know, boys, they like to eat everything, swallow everything. So rocks, whatever, they'll just swallow it, right? That's, I thought maybe that's what he did. Nickel. He gets that from his dad, for sure. Never been one no? He just likes the good stuff. He ate cherry pits? His bowels are fine. Look at him. He's like, I'm doing... What is he saying? All of them? Is that your motto? I eat all of them? Okay. Good. All right. Well, good. You got to eat to live in Minnesota, man. You got to survive. He's eating a shoe now. Look at that. <laughs> You better feed that kid. All right, Ephesians chapter 1. One of many challenges with children, right? Always something that happens. But praise the Lord that it's nothing serious. Amen. God is good to us. It's a blessing that we don't um, have to deal with that. We've had to, you know, there's different sicknesses and things, but we thank God for his goodness. We live in a nation where, you, you know, you have access to a lot of things that, around the world they don't have so we ought to be thankful for that you know yep good pain relief yeah wasn't tripping or anything that's good yeah good i don't like that stuff I took that. I took some of that stuff one time. When that, I, no, I, mine was too. I went to the hospital. Remember when I had that that abscess on my throat? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was, I didn't subscribe. No, I was. I went to the hospital, and they're like, they're like, they they were they were sticking needles in my throat, and they're like trying. They're like, they're, I know there's a cyst there. Do you remember that when that happened? I know there's one there, and this guy's like, he's got my head pinned down like this. And he's like, okay, let me give it another shot. Did you <laughs> give it another. Before this? No, this is before we started street preach. It was right before that. And man, this guy's just sticking my throat with needles. He stuck it like seven times. Finally, he gave me something for it. And um, you stuck it seven, seven times more than you. Yes. But then they put me on this Percocet or something. They're like, here, take this. This will help you. And I was like, well, I ain't preaching. Andrew's going to have to preach. I, stood home. I, I sat at home, and I'm sitting at home on Zoom because we had Zoom back there. Or no, Skype. That's what, remember that? It was Skype. I'm sitting at home, and nobody's there. And I'm by myself. Everybody's at church, and I'm listening on Skype. And all of a sudden, I'm, like, looking down like this, and I'm, like, drooling. I'm, like, <laughs> and I'm laughing at Andrew's sermon. I'm, like, and I'm just, like, I'm like, I don't think I'm supposed to be laughing about this. And, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm like, I'm not taking this anymore. I was like, no more. Okay, guys in white coats, subscribe me medicine. Not a good thing. I got to be careful about that. Yeah, I was like, I was literally like drooling, sitting there laughing at Andrew. And I'm like, I'm glad nobody's here right now. And I'm like, I'm sitting in my chair, and I can't even get up. You know, I'm like... Yeah, that, that medicine is, they're like, yeah, take two. I was like, eh, I'm not doing that again. Oh, I'll be fine. I wasn't fine. Did you have neck on your neck? Well, then my throat swelled up again, and it, because they needed to give me a steroid, not the, they kept giving me funny pills. They're like, here, take these. I'm like, no, I don't really need those. And they finally gave me the steroid, and it, whatever it was, it went away, but, oof. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1. So be careful what doctors prescribe to you. Be careful about how much you take. That's your public service announcement. That'll probably get me thrown in jail sometime, but oh well. That's okay. Ephesians 1, 1. We are going to talk about, again, sanctification here. But we're going to talk about separation. We're going to talk about doctrinal separation today. And then next week, we're going to finish up with separation on practical separation and how that actually, all of that plays out in our life. Because remember, it's the will of God that we be sanctified. Separation is part of that sanctification process. It's the part that, that God has commanded us to do. 
So we have to understand doctrinally some important things that we should state we should be separated from out there in this ecumenical world that we live in today, that we're very careful doctrinally that that's an aspect of our separation, because especially in the days that we live in of apostasy, uh, every Bible teacher can't be trusted. Every every you know teaching out there can't be trusted. We have to really make sure that that whatever we're hearing uh, is following the word of God. And, you know, so doctrinally, we're very careful about, about those things, and uh, they're important. And next week, we'll talk about how practically that looks with the, the doctrines of, of, of separation as opposed, in the world, like how we separate from the world, how we separate from, from some of those other things, how practically that looks. This today is going to really be more of a doctrinal type of a message. It's going to deal more with, uh, you know, what doctrines we should pay close attention to, which is everything, by the way. But there are some things that that would cause us to move quicker than others when it comes to false doctrine and things like that, uh, especially things that the Bible is very clear about. There's some things that with prophecy and other things that the Bible, you know, we could we, we may not we see through a glass darkly. Right. So there's some of the things we don't understand quite perfectly. Uh, there are other things that God has laid out for us very specifically that are not up for us to, uh, you know, try to judge in that sense, but us to obey. So these are important things. Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Then I want you to turn over to Romans chapter 16 and verse 17 through 18, because the Bible warns us of these things. And this goes along with our study here today, this, this morning, and really we're going to be in a lot all over your Bible, so you'll, we'll keep you awake here this morning real well by having you bounce through to the different scriptures. But Romans 16, 17, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. So we'll talk about that more next week, but there's a marking and then there's an avoiding. Right? Those are two things that God commands. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Father in heaven, Lord, we pray you bless us now. Help us to understand this great truth in the scriptures and help us to grow thereby. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, you know, we've been talking about that importance of sanctification, that it's the will of God for, for the believer's life. We talked about moral separation last week and its importance. Uh, if there's anything that's neglected today, it's moral separation. But our moral separation is based on our doctrine. Your doctrine is what, is what dictates your practice. It really is. That's what it should be anyway. The doctrines that we hold to should dictate our practice because the doctrines are the teachings of the scriptures or the teachings of the apostles and how we practice should come straight from the teachings of the word of God. So it, it should, that, that should be how it works. But moral separation and its importance we talked about, we'll probably get into a little bit of that next week as well when we cover more of this. But we also ought to be careful to, to separate from doctrinal error for those that teach doctrinal error, those that teach things that are damnable, those that teach things that are blatantly false. Uh, and there's a few things like that that we'll, dis that we'll discuss here this week. The second kind of separation God requires of the Christian is that doctrinal separation. Sound apostolic doctrine is to be preserved by the churches, while false doctrine is to be avoided. So we are to hold to sound apostolic doctrine. That's what we find in the scriptures, right? What, what Jesus and the apostles spoke, those are the things that we, that we should adhere to, we should follow. Doctrinal separation can be further divided into two aspects, though. The first one is we separate from those who teach false doctrine. So when we have deemed something to be false and we have seen it, then we separate from those people. And secondly, which we'll end with today, we're to separate from the entire apostate last days Christianity that's out there. We don't want to identify with that last that uh, apostate Christianity that is out there. We want to make sure that we we do not identify with those. I, I don't want to shake hands with those people. I don't. I have no desire to be a part of them. I have no desire for those people to like me or like what I preach or like what we stand for. We want to be separate from those people because they are dangerous people that lead men to hell, and uh, we we ought not have any type of fellowship with them but we ought to reprove them. We ought to be very careful 
uh, for that for that sake. We're not talking about a difference of opinion. We're talking about somebody that wholly changes uh, the scriptures and they change uh, what the Bible teaches about godliness and about separation, about a number of other things, and they teach something that is contrary to that. And they and they do deceive the hearts of the simple. That's what they do. So first, we separate from those who teach false doctrine. We are to separate from those who teach uh, those types of doctrines that that, uh, that are not clearly found in the Scriptures or that pervert those doctrines. In Romans 16, 17, we find, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned. So there are proper divisions and there are proper offenses, as you can see there from that text. But when they're contrary to what we have learned in the scriptures, we're to avoid those people, right? There are some people that cause division and offenses based not upon the scriptures, but upon their own false doctrines, which they're to be avoided as well, because they cause a lot of trouble. Second John, verse number 8, we find, Look to yourselves, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. That's the reward that God wants us to have, that God has for us in the end. We're to look to ourselves. We're to be careful. We're to, we're to be careful in our walk with God. We're to be careful to maintain a doctrinal separation from those who preach something contrary to sound biblical doctrine. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. We're going to get into that, but the doctrine of Christ is the number one, which we're going to get to in a few minutes, is the number one important doctrine that we would separate from lost people or from uh, uh, religious apostates from. If their doctrine of Christ is wrong, we want nothing to do with those people. We stay away from their teachings because they're damnable. They're damnable heresies. They, they believe in another Christ, another gospel. So when they transgress and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, they hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house. Neither bid him God speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So then you, you think about the JWs, the Mormons, and the other various religious groups that teach that Jesus is not God. They pervert the person of Christ. We're to mark and avoid them. We're to make very plainly that we do not follow their teachings. Revelation 2 and verse number 2 through 3 talks about this. Jesus said, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not. And hast found them to be liars. Like the charismatics. They call themselves apostles. They're liars. And hast born. And hast patience for my name's sake. And hast labored and hast not fainted. So the Bible says Jesus commends these for them uh, revealing these false prophets, these false apostles, these deceitful workers, and them understanding that, that uh, and, and following the truth, Jesus commends them for that, right? We're plainly commanded to mark and avoid those who teach that false doctrine. So we have to ask our que uh, the question, which doctrines, which doctrines are to be used as the basis for this separation? The answer is that of apostolic doctrine that is clearly presented in the Bible as basis for fellowship and separation. Those, those apostolic doctrines that are clearly represented in the Bible. Not There are some things that, that people don't understand, quite frankly, but the nature of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, who He is, His holiness, the person of God, and then many other things which we'll talk about, they, those things we have to separate over. Because in the end, if you've explained something to somebody they still don't understand it, well, that's their problem. You have to move on. And you have to pray for them and leave it to God. Because spiritual blindness is just that. When people are into false doctrine, you don't understand. It takes a miracle to get them out of it. When they're subverted, it takes a miracle. So prayer is what you need to do, not continual trying to deal with them. After you've dealt with them after the first and second admonition, you're to reject them. And you're to walk away from them and be done with them. Because it's dangerous for you to hear those things in your ears for too long. It'll have an effect on your, on your life and your walk. So you're, you're to stay away from that. Once you've already rebuked somebody twice for that, you've showed them the truth, it's adequate that you've showed them that. It, it takes prayer for a man to be uh, delivered from the, those doctrines because they, they do come, become subverted by Satan at that point, and they're deceived. So we have to be careful about that and remember that. Uh, one, of those, uh, you know, one of those things that I think is, is, is the Bible version issue is an important issue. 
Where do I find the words of God? Do I have the inspired words of God in my hand? Do I know that to be true? And do I believe that to be true, that these, these are the words of God in this King James Bible? Do I believe that? Do I believe this is the inspired, infallible Word of God, that all truth is to be taken from the Word of God? And when I say the Word of God, I mean this book, right. very specifically. I do not mean some book that you right. can't read. Yep. Yep. I do not mean some book that is in a, a, a dead language. I mean a book that is in front of your face that God has given you, purified seven times, that He's given it to you. You have it in your hands, you hold it, and you learn from it. And that's what I say when I mean the Bible or the Word of God. We have to be very clear about that. And the reason why it's so important to be very clear about that is because there are people that are deceived. Very many people are deceived, and, and the book that they read from speaks to something different than your book. It speaks to something different. They, they, they say something different than what your Bible says. You understand that? And that's why, that's why their, their doctrines are different, and that's why they hold the different things, and that's why there's so much mass confusion today which J.C. Philpot warned about in the 1850s, he said that if, 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 if they revise the, the, the English Bible, this is what's going to happen. Everything that he said came true. Every single thing that he said. He just said, basically, just leave your hands off of it. Don't, it's fine. Just leave it alone. You, you're going you're gonna to mar it. You're going to change it. You're going to ruin it. And that's what they did. And they perverted it. Because that's what Satan does. So we'll talk about that in, the, in sometime in the future when we get into the King James Bible issue very specifically, which we will do, uh, not, not in this study, but in something else, which uh, we'll be praying about doing in the future. And number two, we are taught the importance of the first principles. Uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 6. These go beyond the fundamentals of the faith. They are the first principles that we find in the Bible, and they're very important. And these are things we're separating over. Uh, these are doctrines that, that, that are apostolic doctrines that were laid down to us in the scriptures. And Paul is, he, really in, in Hebrews chapter 1 through 5, Paul is, is explaining uh, the principles of the doctrine of Christ. He explains who Christ is. He starts in Hebrews chapter 1, and he says that Christ is God. That's what he says. Right. He starts out with that. Yep. And then he says Christ is better than the angels. And then he right. says Christ is better than Moses. And Christ is better than the law. And he goes through all these things that Christ is better than, right? Because Christ is the best of all. And he goes through everything, Christ better than all. But he takes you through there and he shows you, first of all, that Christ is God. That's the first thing that he does. Uh, Hebrews 6, 1, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. That is spiritual maturity. So he's talking about there. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. Well, that's repentance, which is what gutted today. We'll talk about that a little bit later here this morning. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. What is that? Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Very specific. That's how a man is saved. Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Then he talks about the next thing, of the doctrine of baptisms, right? The many baptisms that are in the Bible, there are different ones. In this, in this time frame that we live in, or dispensation, if you will, it is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And what is that one baptism? It is water baptism, immersion, believer's baptism in deep water, amen? And it'll get you in deep water by most of the theological world today yeah. when you hold to that, because it's what separates us from everybody else. But we, but we rightly divide the word of truth, Amen. right? We believe that. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. That's why Paul says, you, you, he, t he says, you need to teach them on the doctrine of baptisms. They need to understand the different baptisms. And by the way, John's baptism wasn't different than Paul's baptism. We went into that. We'll talk about that some other time again, I'm sure. But it's the same water baptism. It was the same thing. Was there more revelation given? Absolutely there was. Nobody's denying that. But it's the same baptism. Right. It was the same. And I've, I've taught you on that, why Acts 21 is not a different baptism, why Paul baptized those lost men that, that, uh, that uh, came to Christ but never had, uh, no one ever uh, baptized them scripturally. They didn't know who the Holy Ghost was. That's not a Christian. Christians know who the Holy Ghost is. Amen. Right. So anyway, uh, they said they were, they, they didn't say John baptized them. They say John's baptism. That's not the same thing. So anyway, it's just like somebody doing that today. There's a lot of people that get wet that have never gotten baptized because right. they're not even saved. Right. You just be a wet sinner. Right. 
right? That won't do you any good. You got to be born again. Amen? Amen. All right. That's some good theology right there for you. Of the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands, right? Which we talk about the laying on of hands. That's the importance of that. Uh, and uh, of the ministry and everything else like that and, and different things of that nature. And of the resurrection of the dead. What's he talking about? The resurrection of Jesus Christ and, and your resurrection. Jesus being the first fruits of that resurrection and the resurrection of the dead. Looking forward to the future. Man, if, if we ain't got nothing to look forward to, it's just, is it just this life? I got to work till I die and then I just, I'm dead and it's done. No, no, we're looking forward to heaven. Amen. We're looking forward to the resurrection of the, uh, of the saints. Amen. The, the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. That's hell, fire, damnation, right? Those are all doctrines that are important. So when a man tries to take the flames of hell away from him, I don't even have any time for that man. Right? When Billy Graham tried to take the flames, he said it was metaphorical. Right? Tried to take the flames of hell away. Yeah. Right? Resurrection of the dead. Right? Those, those men that don't believe in the resurrection, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses that don't believe in the bodily resurrection, these are important things. These are, see, these are defining factors, friend. Do, your doctrine defines things. When you hold this strong doctrine, it defines things, and it makes some people nervous. Yeah in the religious world. I always, when somebody tells me they want to come here, or they want to visit here and they want to do I'm like, okay, great. But I just want them to know that, I mean, like, we're not looking for you to come change us. Like we're, we're, we believe the Bible. We hold to what we believe for sure. You show us from the Bible what you want to, but when you start bringing in a lot of goofy things and you expect me to fall for it, we're, we're not looking for that, right? We're not looking to make the world happy with us making people comfortable, right? So I'd be careful about those that teach from perverted Bibles as well. I'd be careful about them, and we'll talk about them in the future as well, more, more so. I like what he says here, what Paul says. He says, and this will, this will we do if God permit, amen? Amen, that's, that's looking forward to what God's going to do. It is true that some doctrines are more important than others. That is true. There are, well, for instance, somebody can be wrong on... Uh, the flat earth. They can think, well, the earth's flat, and, and, and then they can make a big deal about that, but, they, but if they understand the doctrine of Christ and they're saved, you know, that's not the same thing. There's one of those doctrines is more important than the other, and that's who Christ is. He's the most important. That's why Paul started with that, the doctrine of Christ, right? He starts with that. So there are doctrines that are more important uh, than others in that sense, because men don't die and go to hell because they have a misunderstanding about the shape of the earth. Like flat earthers will tell you. If you talk to flat earthers, they'll tell you, oh, you're just deceived and you're working for NASA and, and uh, you don't understand the absolute truth that comes out with the flat earth theory. And I, I'm telling you, I've heard them all. They jump on my broadcast all the time. I could be talking about pizza and here they come. And they, they, they jump on there and they start talking about, you just don't even understand that, the depth of knowledge that I retained when I, when I learned about the flat earth theory. I, everything, revelation opened up to me and the whole Bible did. Okay, great. I, th I think you, you've confused the flat earth with, with Jesus Christ, and you're worshiping uh, the earth more than you are the, the Savior, right? Get some balance there. I really don't, if you believe the earth is flat, I'm like, it's, I'm not mad at you. It's, it's okay. I mean, it really is. I'm not going to like start an argument with you. I'm not going to, like, it's okay. I, I'm, I, lots of guys believe lots of things, right? But when you're talking about the doctrine of Christ, that's totally, when you equate one doctrine, that's how you see how people are imbalanced. You be careful about that. In anything that you believe, doctrinally speaking, that you don't make that more important than who Christ is. Because it's easy to do, friend. You and I can get off on a tangent of something and we can run down a road of something and we can make that of absolute importance. And we actually, what we end up doing is become imbalanced. Like, we, we don't understand that God does have some things that, that he says, you know what, if they're wrong about this, you got to depart from them. But there are some things that we can have disagreements on. For instance, I, uh, that, and, and by the way, I, I, I fully do not believe in the gap theory. Okay, I, you all know that. I, I, I don't believe in the gap theory. But I know people that do. Do I believe they're all lost? No, I don't. I believe they're wrong. <laughs> and I absolutely believe that saved people can be wrong. Right. Oh, do I know it, friend. <laughs> do I know it that saved people can be wrong? Yep. 
a lot of times when we believe something like that, something what I, what I would call kind of spurious or different, a lot of times we haven't thought it out to its logical end. It, we, when we look at doctrine, it has to be consistent yeah. with with the rest of the Bible, right. with the rest of doctrine. And sometimes we don't do that. Okay, we don't. We sometimes in our haste of studying something, our excitement of something, we can do that. I know that from experience, and any of us can can do that. So you got to be careful about making statements about that. You know, about people being wrong about something and automatically attributing that to their salvation. Because I'll tell you what, I met some guys. I had some guys with me here in this church, and they're no longer here. They're out chasing vampires in the woods somewhere up north. But but. Those those guys, they boy, they could they could they were they were right down the line on everything that you could ever imagine. But hearts as wicked as the devil, and they weren't real either. And I, I'll tell you, so so you 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 gotta be careful. And there's people that could be just sincerely wrong about some things. So especially things like that, you gotta be careful about that, making statements about that. Because I'll tell you what, God will surprise you. It happened to me. God will, God will humble you with those things. So anyway, I, again, I, you know my differences. You can see uh, my broadcast that I did with David Ickes on uh, the gap theory versus, um, what was it? I forgot what it was. or the Something about the gap. I, I forget what we did. But anyway, uh, we did a long broadcast on it and talked very specifically about everything. And, and by the way, David Ickes is a, a, a geocentrist. He's a dispensationalist. He's, he's, he holds to some of those things more than I do, some of those as far as the, the way that he does things. But, but again, he, so he understands that. And he, but anyway, so uh, you, you just got to be careful with some of that because there's people that are, that are just wrong sometimes. Yeah, but I don't see how they could be. Well, that's your pride. That's why. See, your pride is dictating to you how you don't see somebody else get wrong. And somebody could look at you and say, I don't see how they can be so wrong about this. Right? Hey, come on, preacher. So, I mean, that's yeah, the, the, some of that's our pride. Well, I would never be that stupid to believe that. Careful about that. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? It's just so, some of that is just our pride. And when we deal with one another, especially when you deal with other people, you don't have to, I'm not going to yoke up with them. I don't agree with them, but I. I'm sure not going to tell them they're not saved because of that. I, I, I know my, I got to have my doctrine of salvation down to where I understand it specifically what that, what that entails and, and how that looks. You know what I mean? Before I do something like that, make a, a comment like that, I'd have to have a lot to go on. Philippians 3.17, verse number 18. Let's go there. I'm looking at that clock. Is that clock right? That is, isn't it? How did we start that late? Oh, we did. Oh, I'm going three hours. All right, let's go. All right, Paul's got to get get down the road after lunch, man. I'll I'll try not to keep you too late, brother Paul. <laughs> you pray for brother Paul. He's got a heavy schedule. He's he's facing, and it's 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 making him tired. So you pray for him. It's a lot to deal with, and he's trying to be prepared and do all the things that he's supposed to do, and it's not easy. So you pray for him about that. Philippians 3.17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensemble. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Let me tell you this. You ought to be careful to follow the men that God has put in front of you. And I'm not saying that, you follow the scriptures, obviously, we understand that, but you ought to be careful to follow the men that God has given you, the pastor that God has given you. You ought to be careful to follow that and find out why your pastor believes that and why he follows that. And I try to teach you why I believe certain things and why I do certain things. But you ought to, you ought to do that. You ought to be very careful about that. Because uh, Paul, he made it very specific over and over again about being very clear about that. Now, we know that it's the scriptures that is the number one authority, not the pastor or anything else like that. We get that. But I... But I'm going to tell you something, especially new believers, you can get sucked up into some things really quick if you're not careful. And I've seen men taken straight out, man. They went straight out the door by, by grabbing on to this person and that person and this teaching and that teaching, and they, phew, they're they gone. It can happen. So you've got to be careful about that. Okay? Paul says in, in Philippians 4, 9, those things which you have learned, you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do right so he lists those things he said both learned 
perceived, heard, seen, do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Be careful. If you're constantly walking contrary uh, to your pastor, the things that your pastor teaches that God has given you, don't wonder why sometimes you might not have peace and you might be struggling with a lot of pride. Because people that walk contrary to that, they, they might have some problems with that. I'm not saying that happens very much here, but it can happen in our hearts, okay? Again, we can, we can have this outward submission, but inwardly, we're not really listening. It happens a lot, by the way. But that, that bears out fruit, though. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 15. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So Paul's warning them about following the leadership they've been given. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 13 through 16 gives us a lot of admonition here. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelt in us. This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes, the Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesephorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. In these references, Christians are not exhorted to follow only the major doctrines of the Bible, but all apostolic doctrine in the scriptures, right? To be careful to follow what the Bible says. Acts 2.42 says that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and breaking of bread, and in prayers. Boy, I'll tell you what, you want to be a disciple of Christ? Just memorize that verse and live by it. Look what, he, look what they said, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Number one, the word of God, in the apostles' doctrine, right there. Right? That's important, isn't it? And in fellowship, boy, you got to be in fellowship with God's people. You need to be in a church. You need to be in fellowship with those people. And I'm talking about intimate fellowship with those people. You need to be walking and, and, and loving one another and caring for one another. Amen. You ought to be close to one another. These, are, By the way, the, I firmly believe these in this room, these ought to be the closest relationships that you have in this world. If they're not, you ought to reexamine your priorities. Amen. These ought to be the closest relationships that you have. You think, no, this person, no, no, I'm telling you, God called you out of this world for a reason, right? He called you from the world of darkness, and he called you for a reason, and he gave you a church, and he calls the church a family, he calls it, he calls it uh, a body, he calls it many things, but they, these are to be your closest relationships. Well, that sounds kind of cultic. No, that sounds kind of biblical. Amen. Unless you want to identify with all of them out there. I got no desire to identify with a bunch of fruits and nuts. I don't want to be a part of them. I don't, I, I don't hate them. I want to see them saved, but I don't want to identify with what they're doing and where they're going. They're going to hell. Who do you want to identify with? <laughs> right? Who do you want to spend most of your time with, right? Uh, some speak of just the fundamentals of the faith, though, right? Or the Apostles' Creed, or the Nicene Creed, or, or, or Nicene Creed, or whatever they call it. I don't, I, I don't speak any of those languages. But anyway, they, they, they go by all those creeds and all those other things. Do I go by that? Not really. I go by the Bible. We go by the Word of God. That's our authority, right? We start getting, And it doesn't mean that we can't learn from some of those people, right? But nowhere in Scripture are we, to, in scripture are we told that our basis for unity and separation is to be limited only to a few doctrines and creedal statements or to man-made labels, particularly labels which have become watered down and contaminated, right, with the day, right? So let's look at some of the specifics here quickly. Um, number one, well, we're not going to be quick because I don't do anything quick, but anyway, we'll do it. I might have to finish half of it uh, this afternoon, maybe. We'll see. I don't know. My goodness. What time did I, Ryan, how long have I been going on Sermon Audio? Because that's when we started. Oh, is that it? Oh, I got plenty of time. You guys got an hour and a half. All right. Uh, the doctrine of Christ, the Holy Ghost, and salvation. It's the first one. The doctrine of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 1 through 4. I want you to look at your Bibles here. 
The doctrine of Christ is worth separating for, and we should. Amen. If people are wrong about who Christ is, well, I'll tell you what, yep. man, people go to hell being wrong right. about who Jesus is. 2 Corinthians 11, 1. Would to God you would bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, let me back up here and say this to you. I didn't plan on putting this. I don't have this in my notes. But let me say this to you. you got to understand that a pastor is going to be very jealous over his, over his flock. Amen. So I'm gonna, I, I am going to get into your business. Right. That's, that's what I do. Amen. I mean, that's if I care. That's, that's why I, that's, I'm jealous over you. Right. right? I put you before. I've learned to do this, too, not to be distracted. To put you before people online, ministry stuff online, all those, oh, no, 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 it's right here first. Amen. This is where, besides my family and my walk with God, this is my first responsibility is the flock, feeding the flock of God. Amen. And caring about and pastoring you. Right. Uh, by the way, don't you ever diminish my office by thinking all I do is just get up and preach to Amen. you. Amen. That isn't all I do. Right. Right. That's a very important thing that I do. And it's it's one of the most important things. But it's not the only thing that I do. Right. It's to pastor you right. and to find out how you're doing and your walk with life and how things are going. Right. And if I see something that's not right, to say Amen. something to you. That's love. If I didn't care, I'd just shut my mouth. But I'm not a jobber, okay? Right. I'm not. I don't, I don't collect some kind of paycheck and just continue on with business as usual hey, running the corporation. Yeah. If I see your life going towards a train wreck, I'm going to stand in the way. Right. right? That's what a shepherd does. Hey, and that's what Paul is saying. He's very jealous over them. He was jealous over them, and I should be. Right? right. I, I should be. That's my right. duty to be that way. Right? If I see something that's going to damage you or destroy you or hurt you, I need to help you with that. Paul said, For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled at Eve through his subtlety. That's how it happens. Through his subtlety. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, which you have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Now, Paul is being sarcastic there. He's saying, oh, if I come preaching to you Christ, you don't want, you don't, you question my apostleship. But if some joker comes around and he's preaching a false Christ to you and he's preaching, you'll bear with him. Right? Yeah. right? You'll bear with him. Y'all yo, will be okay with him. Or preaching another spirit, right? Uh, Some spooky, charismatic spirit. Oh, you like that. Right? That, that makes you feel good. Yeah, come on. Right? So Paul warns about that, right? He's, he's warning about that. The doctrine of Christ is the number one reason for a doctrinal separation. If they teach contrary to the Bible concerning who Christ is, you mark and avoid them. It is, it is dangerous. Very dangerous. If they teach adoptionism, that Jesus Christ became God in the flesh at his baptism or something like that. If they teach that a Jesus that is not holy and righteous, like the world's Jesus. Uh, go look at that video from the last... Um, I, I, di I haven't put that video on separately. I need to. But the conversation I have with those people about our sign... Remember when I asked everybody out there, Paul, I did a new thing out there. I, I started asking all these people, uh, I asked them, what do you think about my banner? What do you think about my sign? I tried to engage them, right? I wanted them to engage me to talk to me while the preachers are down there preaching. So I, we and Garrick set up a little ways after, and I started to ask some questions. Boy, I got some interesting answers. I got some good feedback, some good dialogue from people. I, a guy admitted that, yeah, he formed a God in his own mind and heart. It's not the guy. He, got, he admitted that he doesn't believe the God of the Bible. I said, man, you, you're a pretty honest guy. You admit what most people won't even say. Might be hope for that guy, right? He could admit that. But you know something? If they preach that Christ, if they teach against the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, and they're preaching against that actively, I'm telling you, those modalists and those others, I was shocked to see the amount of modalism and false doctrine that was preached by a number of those Ruckmanite groups. Yeah. 
I couldn't believe they let this man in their pulpit. They, I couldn't believe they, they spread his works around. I can't even remember the guy's name right now. But he was going around and he was preaching in these pulpits. And he didn't even, he was preaching modally. He's preaching oneness. And, and these guys were having him in. One guy told me, one Ruckmanite told me, he said, he was a guy out of Michigan. And he said to me, I'll name him, his name's Chad Reese. He's a guy out of Michigan. And he said, and he said, uh, he goes, I'd rather have him preach than you preach because you're post-trib. Wait a second. Do we understand Bible doctrine? Do we understand that he's preaching against the Trinity? Which is the Godhead, which is, I mean, it's like who God is in essence. Right? Over, over the timing of the rapture? Really? Do we have our priorities straight? Because I've had pre-trib guys preach here. But if they preach that garbage, they wouldn't preach here. Right? Right? Because that's against God. That's against who God is. Amen. Friend, there's some things to get excited about. And I'm not saying all doctrine is not worth getting excited about. But what I'm saying is things concerning Christ, yeah, amen. damnable. Good preaching. Damnable. We ought to have that understanding. Who Christ is will be the difference of heaven and hell. Whom do men say that I am? Whom do ye say that I am? Right? Men may say a lot of things of who Jesus is, but when you answer, when you stand before God, that question is asked, who do you say that Jesus right. is? Jesus asked that very personal question, whom do you say that I am? Yeah. Whom do ye? You. That's the question God asks you today. Who do you say Jesus is? Right? Is he Lord? Then follow him. Is he God? Is he your Savior? Is he the Savior? Did he die for your sins? Was he buried? Did he rise again from the dead? Amen? Then you ought to trust him. Amen? You ought to believe him. Who Christ is will be the difference between heaven and hell. We see in John, John chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, and many more, they all teach the deity of Christ. If any man teaches contrary to sound doctrine of Christ, put a mark and avoid him. It's dangerous. The doctrine of the Holy Ghost and his work. We have to be very careful to mark those charismatics and those others not have anything to do with them. By the way, you learn after you've been saved for a while and pastored for a while, you learn to spot them when they come into your church or they come in. You learn to kind of spot who they are and what they believe, and you're just like, yeah, right. You just you, you keep your distance with them. They start talking. When, when someone talks about the gifts of the Spirit more than they do the Savior, you've got a problem. Amen. When they start talking about... Uh, those miraculous gifts and signs and wonders and everything else, and they don't talk about who Jesus is. Like, they don't talk about the person of Christ. They don't talk about His holiness, His righteousness, who He is, that He is God, right? When they start doing that, you already know what, where, where they're at and what their direction is, right? It's a dangerous one. Charismania has completely taken over many churches, yeah. infiltrated them through that false doctrine. But there, by the way, there is a danger today, though, for all of us to minimize the work of the Holy Ghost, right? Yep. Or to morph it into a spectacle or a show. There's a balance either way. We don't want to, I, I can't, we should never minimize the work of the Holy Ghost. He is God in us, amen? And he is God, and he is a person. The Bible says very specifically, he is not a force, he is not a movement, he is a person. The Holy Ghost is a person. He is the comforter. And by the way, he is said to be he on purpose. Amen. Yeah. Not what the charismatic little Fruit Loops and the patriarch haters tried to say today that, oh, the Holy Ghost is the feminine. Well, why does it call him he then? Yep. Come on. You learn that from you learn that from the Kabbalah. You learn that from the Bible. Right. Yeah. Jesus is uh, the Father and and the Son and the Holy Ghost are all referenced as he, <laughs> and man was made in his yeah. image. Amen. He. Amen. And we are filled with His Spirit. And He is the Comforter. Amen. What's that? Not them and they. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, yes. Yep. Yep. It matters. Those words matter. Every word matters. They do matter. 
those words are very, words are specific. They're there for a reason, right? And it's very scary what they're doing with it now. I, you would never convince me in a million years that a Ruckmanite would ever teach that on the Holy Ghost modalism. And you would never convince me of that. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not bashing. I'm just saying, I, that's why I'm so shocked by it. Because I was like, well, they didn't get that from Ruckman. They didn't get that from me. He didn't preach that. When you're preaching modalism, run around doing that. And then when he tried to explain it, it just got worse. Wow. It just, it literally got worse. It, it just kept getting worse. It's like, please shut up. Just stop. It's getting bad. You're, you're like, you're into damnable heresy. You know, it's, it's bad. It, it, it's bad. Galatians 1, 6. I marvel. You know what? Here's another thing. The gospel of who Jesus is, the gospel which is centered around the person and work of Christ is something to separate over. Look at Galatians 1, 6 through 9. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. This is what they do today. They pervert. The, they don't stop using the word gospel. They like to use that. They just pervert what it means. They, their definition is different. They pervert it. But there be some that trouble you. I would pervert the gospel of Christ. By the way, heresy is very troubling. That type of heresy is very troubling. But though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, then that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have received, than that you have received, let him be accursed. You know, that's kind of like if they gut repentance out of their gospel message. By the way, you can preach the gospel, well, you can preach a form of the gospel, perverted form of the gospel in such a way that doesn't offend anybody. And, every, and almost everybody will pray. And almost everybody will do that. Why? Because they're not offended. They, they don't think they're guilty. They don't think they're sinners. They don't think they're guilty. Right? There are people that don't think they're guilty. They don't know they're guilty because no one tells them. Their preachers don't tell them that. They take repentance out of their gospel message and they teach men they don't need to repent. Like Stephen Anderson and other men like that. And a great number of the Hiles churches that don't preach repentance. A great number of them. A great number of them, by the way. We're to mark and avoid them for teaching things contrary to the gospel. It's a dangerous thing to preach another gospel and to gut repentance and the righteous commands of God on the sinner and to gut that, that and to change definitions of repentance to change what it means to repent, such as to be called out, marked, and avoided as dangerous. See, they use the word repent, but they don't, believe, they don't mean what you're saying. They said, oh, repent is, is, is turning from unbelief to belief. I mean, I can't tell you how many of those guys I got an argument with. They said, oh, you're preaching work salvation. Why? Because I believe you ought to repent, like the Bible says. They said, well, Jesus preached repentance. John the Baptist preached repentance. All the apostles preach repentance. The Old Testament prophets preach repentance. Right? All of them did. And what does it mean? It means a radical change of mind that leads to a change of action with sorrow in the heart. That turning from sin to Jesus, to the Savior. It's a turning. It's understanding I'm a sinner and I'm wicked before God. And I hate it. Right? And I don't want to live like that. I don't want to be that person. There's, a, there's some sorrow that goes along with that. Right? in understanding how we've broken God's righteous commands, and how we are guilty before God. You see, these lascivious, lascivious people, they, they preach a gospel of lasciviousness. That's what they do, right? They preach a gospel that allows you to stay dead in trespasses and sins, that, allow, that, that keeps you the same as it found you. That's a very dangerous gospel. Very dangerous to preach to men that they... That, uh, I had one guy tell me, he said that, well, that repentance means to turn from unbelief to belief. I said, okay, well, let me ask you a question. Is unbelief sin? He wouldn't answer. I asked him again, is unbelief sin? He wouldn't answer. I asked him 10 times, and it, finally, after the 10th time, he goes, okay, 
If I answer and say that unbelief is sin, you're going to say that that's repentance. That's repenting of sin. I said, yes, I am. Because <laughs> it is sin. That's right. We were done. We were done. No more questions. Done. Done with you. But he didn't want to answer the question because why? Well, unbelief is sin. That's one of the greatest sins that we commit is unbelief. That we don't believe the record that God has given us. Right. You, you, we die and go to hell because we're sinners. And one of those sins is we don't believe God. We go our own way. That's a very grievous sin. Yeah. To not to believe God. That's very grievous not to believe him. Right? Jesus said that, that, not, that you shall all likewise perish. So of course it's a sin. It's a terrible one. Right? It's a terrible sin. So people... But they twist those things around. It's very dangerous. And that's why I won't preach. I won't preach, street preach with those guys. If they don't believe in repentance, I don't, I don't preach to any yeah, of those people. Right, right. And of course, most of them don't preach anyway on the street. They don't want to. Well, they don't, they don't have anybody to tell. They, they tell the sodomites you can't repent. Well, the reason why you tell sodomites they can't repent is because you don't believe in repentance. Right. That makes sense. I had a, church, I had, I had a pastor that um, when I was in his church... <laughs> He told me he didn't believe, he told me he didn't believe in, uh, in church discipline. Well, he didn't believe in repentance either. And he learned that from Hiles. Well, of course you don't believe in church discipline. You don't believe in repentance. Yeah. What's well, a horrible place to leave people at that can't get right with God, right? Don't tell them they need to get right with God. Just continue on in sin that grace may abound. God forbid. See, when you see the lascivious lives of many of these professing Christians, don't wonder when repentance has been gutted out of their message. You see it. We see them on the streets all the time. When we talk to them, there's no change in their life. There's nothing new. You would not have so many false converts today out there if there was not a gospel reductionism going on today. That They didn't reduce the gospel down to a sentence. And and not break up the fallow ground by preaching the law of God, and letting the Holy Ghost do that work, right? They don't do it. And that's why nobody's mad at them, by the way. Why do you think nobody's mad at Billy Graham? Why do you think nobody gets mad at the Graham Crusade? Why do you think, no, why do you think Jews go there and go back to their, their, um, their synagogues? Well, they're not mad. Nobody told them to repent. No, nobody made them get right. They go back to their JW churches. They go back to their, they just go back. And they just had one good religious feel good meeting. Just one dose of the Holy Ghost. Right? That's why. That's why nobody, doctrine makes people mad. When you start talking about doctrine. Yeah. By the way, next, the doctrine of the resurrection. Doctrine regarding prophecy and future things, such as the resurrection. Hymenius and Philitus, what did they do in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 16? But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Right. The, the resurrection is part of the gospel. If they're wrong about the resurrection, if they're wrong about that, you got to mark and avoid them. They're in trouble. Right? That resurrection is important doctrine. Jesus rose from the dead, and we're going to follow him. Amen? Right. We're going to rise from the dead one day. Amen? So that's, that's an important doctrine. And to take people's hope away by telling them there ain't no resurrection, right? Or there's no bodily resurrection or, um, uh, what is it called? Uh, annihilation. Annihilation. Right? Teaching and preaching annihilation. Well, you just, you know, if, if you don't do good, then you just die and go into the ground and you're just annihilated. Really? Well, that would make men most sorrowful. What in the world would you want to live for God for then? There's no future. You could tell those men have never been changed by the gospel because when you're changed by the gospel, you want to live for God. And you know it. You know you're going to see him one day. Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Amen. See that? Works. Next, the doctrine of the church. Very important doctrine. The doctrine regarding the church is to be a basis for separation. By the way, not, when I say church, there's only one. I mean that local New Testament church. I don't mean the figment of people's imaginations or Augustine's playbook or origins, whichever one it was, one of those heretics. 
Um, I, I don't mean theirs. I mean what you're sitting in today, right now, what you're, how you're gathered and assembled together. And I don't mean the people that, oh, you're talking about brick and mortar. No, I'm not. We can meet in a field. Yeah. We meet in barns. Yeah. yeah, we have. Amen. The hidden barn sermons that nobody's Amen. heard. Those are the special barn sermons, right? Those are, someday we're going to release the barn sermons. <laughs> when we get past liability, we're going to release, I'm kidding. <laughs> we're going <laughs> to, right? We have we have the barn barn burn, barn burn the barn burners the barn sermons, right? Our uh, expressing of our our civil uh, what was that? What do you call that? Our our civil uh, disobedience. The civil the, the righteous rebellion series. <laughs> we'll release that sometime. We got them all. Well, Amen. Those are fun. Amen. I had a good time with those. Amen. Those were good. Paul was in his overalls. It was great. No, he wasn't. He was in a suit. Didn't you wear your overalls with a tie one time? I think. No. I, can't, I, can't, I can't remember. I, I thought maybe you did. I couldn't remember. Boy, we had some fun, didn't we? It was a blessing. It was a blessing. But he says here, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of the truth. He states what the church is. He's very, Paul states very clearly what the church is. He's not telling you how to behave in some invisible, uh, universal invisible assembly that you're never together with. Well, this is how you behave there. Why well, are you never going to be there? So what does it matter? Yeah, exactly. This is the pillar and the ground of the truth. The Amen. church of the living God. Right. You're, the church is. That's, it's not some uh, invisible, invisible universal thing, right? It's, I mean, Paul did an awful lot of instructing for offices, for ordinances, for everything else, for this just to be some big invisible thing somewhere. I mean, yeah, I can, for the life of me, right. I cannot figure out how anybody gets that, like that. But, hey, I've been wrong about stuff too. So, But it's just, it's amazing to me how it's so literal. But I got trained, I mean, I cut my teeth on Baptist doctrine. When I first got saved, I, they, I just had all these Baptists thrown at me, and I'm like, okay. So I just started reading after them. They're like, oh, yeah, and watch this. Be careful of this. Because there's a bunch of universal invisible people, uh, yeah. universal uh, church doctrine out there that's teaching that. And, ba and, and, and by the way, the Internet set it up for that t long ago. Satan knew the things that are coming down the pike like that. And you have the Internet, you have everything else, which sets it up for that universal invisible church. It sets it up for them to think that that's church. So then you, you have all these pastors that were just fine staying on lockdown for like months. Right, staying away from church assemblies. When when Tim Tim Waltz told them, you can, okay, you can have ten percent, twenty percent, thirty percent. I was like, yeah, whatever. Right, right. Who did you tell to go home? Like, who could you look at your your, your church members and be like, I'm sorry, <laughs> you got to go home. <laughs> look, this this family can stay, but this one has to go. Boy, that'd go real well. Why do you want them here, not me? Could you, could you imagine? They make better food. The, the, the casserole's good. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, wait, we weren't supposed to have food either. I forgot. And don't share food and don't sing. Yeah, okay. Anyway, remember that? Remember the, remember the good old days back when you, yeah. They said to sing with a mask on. They did say that. Choir's up there with masks. That would be funny. Well. We, we kindly disobeyed that. We were kind. Yes. I thought we were kind. Even when I was accused of sticking it in the governor's face, which I've never met. He didn't ask me to come pray. Maybe he will. I'll send him the barn sermons. Maybe he will. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, under the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. You know, much of the New Testament doctrine tells us how to proper order and discipline in the body. The instructions in the body, right? Much of it does. Let me see. I might just stop right here. Let's see. Oh, yeah. I, I better. I better. I'll stop right here at the doctor of the church. We will pick this up this afternoon. That's what we'll do. Because I want to make sure you get the whole enchilada. The whole. And notice I did not call, I did not call Aaron an enchilada. Right, Aaron? 
right? I did not. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, but um, these things so far, we're going to talk, we're going to get more to the doctrine of the church. We're going to get more to holy living because these are things that are not preached today yeah. or doctrines that are, right. that are actually hated today. Right. They're hated. But look at the damage they're causing. Yes. And it's like people, God's people have to wake up. And if, they, if they're not in a church that's preaching right, they need to get to one that is. I'm, I'm fully glad these go online and people hear that because they need to understand that. You need to get into a church that's preaching and teaching the truth of the gospel. I mean, you stay in those apostate churches, all you do is prop them up. Yeah, you just, you just support them and then you get weak. And then God's people can't, then when they hear hard preaching, they, they get mad. They get kind of angry about it. Why? Because they've, they've been under that soft stuff for so long, and it's, it's not going anywhere. Friend, we're on our way to heaven. We're going somewhere. We're, we're, I, God is prepared. This church is to prepare you for heaven, right? That's what we're doing, to live this life, and we're marching to Zion. We just don't sing it. We believe it. That's what we're doing, right? We're marching to Zion. We're going somewhere, and we need to remember that. Brother Lee, why don't you pray for us and ask the Lord to uh, just drive home these truths into our hearts today and also uh, pray for the day and, and, and pray the Lord blesses our time together and our fellowship that we would walk with him and, and that we'd be, we'd be loving one to another. Amen. Lord, I just want to thank you for our church, Lord, that you uh, gathered all of us together so many years ago. You started it. I want to thank you for it, Lord, and that it's uh, helped. It helps so many of us every every day, uh, week that we come here. We 